gastrointestinal disease, uh, surgical disease series and uh, a common presentation which uh, comes for long cases and uh, SCQs and uh, essay questions and uh, many MCQs are formed on this particular topic uh, that is rectal bleeding. The question can be modified uh, in various ways to connect it to various lower gastrointestinal symptoms like constipation and diarrhea, uh, tenesmus and uh, uh, painful bleeding, painless bleeding. So the hi history will be given by the patient or in a CQ it will be presented. Uh, in addition to rectal bleeding, it will be presented with some other symptoms in history, but you should immediately recognize that the discussion is going to be on uh, rectal bleeding when it comes to it, if the word is there. So that's why I put the heading as rectal bleeding with altered bowel habits. Let us move on. Um, the moment uh, this type of a case comes, a long case given or a CQ short history is given, 45 year old woman presenting with history of passing blood per rectum. Scientific term as you know is hematochasia uh, and with uh, all the other additional details, few details will be given. But uh, the main complaint will be bleeding. So the bleeding could be fresh blood or altered blood or could be streaks of blood. But ultimately the discussion is going to get centered around a standard set of working diagnosis. The moment you come across this complaint, you should have a working diagnosis. So in an adult, uh, the first diagnosis will be, as you all have been already told, rectal cancer, colorectal cancer. Out of that, uh, rectal cancer is uh, generally associated with rectal bleeding and uh, far away the cancer is in the colon. Bleeding may not be fresh blood, but still it will be there, but other symptoms like constipation, Altering, alternating bowel habits uh, and other symptoms of right-sided colonic cancers such as anemia uh, will uh, come to the scene. But the moment this history comes, you have to think the first diagnosis you must say rectal cancer. And then comes the uh, much rarer causes in this part of the world, but in the other parts of the world, you know, Europe, in Western world, inflammatory bowel disease is quite common and uh, as a differential diagnosis, uh, sometimes it has, it is given the first place uh, even above rectal cancer. And the third diagnosis is diverticulosis and diverticular disease and diverticulosis, which you have to have some basic idea. Again, we do not see as many cases as uh, the European see this diverticulosis because of our, our food habits. And uh, then the dysentries, generally they do not come for a long case, but when you are discussing an ECQ or a theory question, all dysentries like bachelor dysentery, amoebic dysentery, they all come to the see because they are quite common uh, in this part of the world. But uh, very unlikely that for a long case you will get uh, a, a dysentery. But amoebiasis, the chronic amoebiasis, long term with long term symptoms, alternating symptoms, blood and mucus, diarrhea uh, can be discussed in a long case uh, as a cold case. Let's 
by just a minute. Okay, uh, here we go. Then again, if when it comes to the uh, history, uh, as I have been have been explaining all the other long cases in the previous uh, cases, uh, first part of the history should be describing the nature of this rectal bleeding, what is the type of uh, bleeding. Because in the marking scheme, we will be looking for these points, just like the other long cases. So, nature of the bleeding, if it is fresh blood, uh, we know that we are thinking about uh, generally hemorrhoids and the uh, more benign causes. And then painful bleeding, it could be associated with. Now, fissure in ANO is the number one you. Fissure in ANO is number one you uh, you will think of. Um, um, but again, that you will not get uh, for a long case. But in the discussion, you must uh, say that. Uh, and uh, tenosmus, another question you should have asked uh, during uh, history taking. Tenosmus is generally the intense. Sometimes we ask, what do you mean by tenosmus? So you should be able to explain that. The intense desire to defecate uh, with producing little bit of blood or mucus. And uh, generally tenosmus is the, uh, uh, the underlying cause of the tenosmus will be a low, very low rectal cancer and uh, rectal prolapse and solitary rectal ulcer. We, this is being a revision class, we might not be able to go into the details of this, but if any part is unclear, I think you have to uh, just uh, refer back to your notes and then uh, get the details. Uh, now, if somebody asks what is a solitary rectal ulcer, you should be able to answer in the long case, you say that, no, why did you ask for tenosmus? And you will say that I am thinking of lower rectal cancer and rectal prolapse and solitary rectal cancer. Uh, so you should be able to explain what you see. And then the nature of the blood again, whether it's well mixed with stools, which is the feature of colorectal cancers, most of it. Uh, and then the presence of mucus. Uh, is more in favor of inflammatory bowel disease and uh, chronic infections. But uh, then the, this tumor called villus adenoma, you should have heard about it. Villus adenoma, it produces lots of uh, mucus and then uh, it's rich in potassium and you get a lot of mucus uh, blobs coming out of, uh, uh, coming with the stools. So you have to always think of this villus adenoma. And then uh, automatically in the past medical history, inflammatory bowel disease, pelvic irradiation and cancer colon, whether they, he has had a history of cancer, colonic cancer, uh, is a point you have to ask. I think we'll be repeating it again. Uh, why I'm giving this list is that with the interpretation, you should include this in your history whenever you are either discussing or presenting a, a lower GI bleeding. Um, Tenosmus, we have already told that dyscasia, again, dyscasia is painful uh, defecation in anal fissures. And all, always, you know, anal fissures, you have to uh, know a few things about it. And if it is recurrent anal fissures, Crohn's disease has to be kept in mind. And uh, alternating constipation and uh, blue stools, again another question you should have asked in your focused history. The patient might not volunteer this information. In all long cases, they will not volunteer, but you should have this list about say 8 to 10 
direct questions for each type of presentation. So, uh, features of uh, is a constipation, it could be uh, constipation or absolute constipation. Absolute constipation will not come for the long cases, uh, that is constipation for stools and uh, platelets both. And uh, those are generally features of uh, annular left coronic cancers. And the words furious diarrhea, I'm sure you would have heard about it, is uh, that the patient is constipated and these stools get liquefied and on and off, part of it is passed as liquid stools. So the patient thinks that it is constipation with alternating diarrhea, but it's not a true diarrhea, it's a false diarrhea. That's why it's called a spurious diarrhea. Um, and then uh, proctalgia is another question you have to ask, whether there is any uh, pain there uh, in the pain felt in the rectum. Usually it's a feature of uh, neurogenic uh, causes and hemorrhoids and solitary rectal ulcers. Uh, again, the rectal rectal ulcers is a kind of a part of rectal prolapse. Pelvic radiation we have already mentioned. Uh, asking whether it's a toddy drinker was a historical question actually nowadays toddy is still popular among uh, the villagers and uh, this uh, sort of people outside the urban areas um, why it is toddy drinking is specifically asked is that amoebiasis is quite common among them uh, because uh, toddy sometimes contain uh, amoebic amoebic uh, transmission, it contributes to amoebic transmission when the crows uh, defecate into those. So uh, then uh, polypos is coli, the history, family history, you have to ask because as you know all colorectal cancers uh, have this sequence of polyps becoming cancers. So uh, malignant change is uh, there. So, polypose is called a family, polypose is called a, in the family history, it is an important question you should have asked. The other points are that uh, previous cholecystectomy and uh, urinary diversion, in the past it has been shown that they are carrying a high risk of uh, uh, rectal and rectosigmoid cancers because uh, cholecystectomy is the cause is not very clear. Urinary diversion of course it is uh, at the point of ureters opening into the sigmoid. It is a kind of diversion method which is now rarely done. So uh, when you are taking the history as active questions or focus questions these two points uh, if you have asked, I think it gives you a bonus. Fecuria and pneumaturia, another two questions should be included in your history uh, because it shows that there is a malignancy which may be advanced or it may be diverticular disease. As you know, diverticular disease is quite uh, notorious to give rise to uh, fistulae and uh, fecuria and hematuria polycycle fistula and a set of metastatic symptoms, few questions uh, like, like hypochondrial pain, sudden loss of weight, uh, jaundice, bout of jaundice, cough. This of course we are quite used to ask these questions. Uh, any presenting complaint, these leading questions for metastatic symptoms you should be ready to ask. So that's the easy part to remember actually because those are kind of non-specific questions but uh, when the examiner is listening to your history he will know that you are asking these questions because you think of uh, metastasis, colorectal cancer metastasis. Then of course the first examiner will finish his uh, job when he has listened to this part of the history. And uh, what will happen is that you know when you are 
giving the history we might listen it listen to it for a few minutes and then some examiners might disturb and ask why did you ask this why did you ask this so then you should be able to give the interpretation i have given and uh, sometimes we wait for you to finish the first part of the history because as you know by the time you have finished this focused questioning and you have come to these uh, routine questions then uh, the examiners have generally lost I mean, surgical examiners most of us have lost our interest in listening to the history but we'll wait to see whether you have completed these points and then uh, the second part as usual we'll be asking uh, what did you look for give us your examination findings so uh, again you start with general examination usual general examination is anemia lymphadenopathy as i always tell you there are five edema cyanosis jaundice but whatever you say this general examination be sure that uh, you have taken that history uh, for a reason you should be able to interpret it and most important part is anemia so uh, anemia generally is, means could be prolonged bleeding or it may be general disseminated malignancy especially if it is associated with cachexia so uh, malignant cachexia means anemia includes anemia and asthenia so then uh, chest examination is important because you must say that passing by uh, you have looked for effusions and air entry because when you are talking about rectal bleeding the whole discussion is going to get ultimately focused into a uh, colorectal malignancy in most occasions because uh, very uh, only occasionally you will be given a case of ibd inflammatory bowel disease or diverticular disease because those are generally post graduate uh, uh, subjects uh, post graduate cases so what will happen is that most of the discussion will be focused on the malignancies so uh, you would say that i will concentrate i have gone through the abdomen and abdominal examination so you concentrate more on abdominal examination and findings so as usual you will say that uh, describe the abdomen and then uh, say that you look for uh, hepatomegaly and uh, free fluid because interpretation is very straightforward hepatomegaly is generally for metastatic liver deposits you always look for it uh, occasionally there is a chance that you might get a good liver you know uh, who has been there in the ward for some time a patient who has been there with a palpable liver so very carefully look for the liver uh, and pal- liver with a palpable metastasis is uh, not very commonly found in the exams but Uh, palpable liver you must look for it, look for it because if you miss it and then your colleague has found it and there is a liver i think that is that will be taken as a uh, kind of a serious slaps so uh, then uh, look for hepatic bruise but uh, these findings are generally you do, might not find a hepatic bruise but missing a palpable liver is uh, going to be a serious lapse and then uh, always uh, in general examination say that i examined the abdomen looking for masses in the right iliac fossa that is for right coronic masses especially the cecum because uh, what happens is most of the time it's either a cecal mass or a left iliac fossa it's a sigmoid mass and the sigmoid masses or left iliac uh, fossa masses if you have found one then of course you have to quickly think of differential diagnosis uh, most of the left uh, colonic cancers uh, it may not be the cancer which is palpable 
the cancer may be an annular cancer with constipated fecal matter or with constipation and fecal matter filling up the sigmoid colon and the mass you will feel uh, is going to be the fecal masses and then uh, if the examiner asks or says that you know if you are feeling a left iliac fossa mass what's the differential diagnosis this explanation you can give always you can say that this is what i'm feeling may be a left colonic cancer but if especially the indentation sign is there when you are pressing in thin people when you press that mass sometimes you feel that your fingers are going into uh, uh, like a boggy mass so that is actually fecal matter and you can say that you know this is fecal matter but i have to exclude a, a annular constricting left sigmoid cancer before treating this patient an inflammatory bowel disease again you can get masses especially uh, in Crohn's disease and uh, chronic diverticular mass diverticular fluorosis and diverticular masses might not come for a, a long case if it is just after acute episode but there is a possibility when you are discussing it always say that chronic diverticular disease and diverticular masses a possibility and uh, locally advanced sigmoid carcinoma is the straightforward answer then uh, always look for palatable kidneys because uh, advanced uh, rectal cancers can be uh, can cause hypernephrosis and then uh, you would always say that in all lower GI uh, symptoms you must say that uh, if you are not if you are allowed to do a dre do a dre but nowadays of course uh, people are not allowing the patients to undergo dre exams so general question will be now if i love you to do a dre what will you be looking for so you must say that uh, i'm i will be doing a biomanual palpation and i'll be looking for uh, basically rectal masses and also uh, prostatic masses because in the advanced prostatic cancer uh, can mimic a lower rectal cancer it can even have bleeding per rectum even which is not a very common presentation but as a differential diagnosis you can always see that uh, then looking for a heart prostate is very uh, you always say that you felt look for the prostate you felt for the prostate and then the pelvic masses say that i look for i will look for pelvic masses uh, especially uh, to see whether there is extensive local spread like winging if the, there is a mass and there is it is extending to the lateral pelvic wall uh, that shows that this advanced uh, rectal cancer and uh, if you mention this word blummer shelf you should know the meaning of it that is generally uh, deposits in the uh, rectovesical pouch uh, secondary to lung pancreas and stomach primaries so uh, second examiner when it comes to the long case will generally concentrate on how will you investigate and uh, basic investigations always keep it at your fingertips like full blood count and uh, it's all as i always say that it's always nice when you are presenting you would say full blood count and hemoglobin level i would do uh, to exclude chronic blood loss leading to anemia or advanced malignancy replacing the bone marrow so you give the interpretation without waiting for the examiner to ask so also we can, we can say that low hemoglobin levels could be due to malignant cachexia uh, with uh, anorexia and asthenia uh, and which can lead to uh, uh, anemia 
So generally this is the presentation of cecal tumors as you already know cecal tumors are generally not presented with bowel symptoms. They generally come with anemia due to chronic blood loss and they will not present as uh, rectal bleeding uh, very often. Then the fecal local blood, you will send, send for re fecal local blood, it's a immunochemical test and know a few things about it, how to collect samples and uh, so forth. And stools for AOC, again stool sample for these things. Again, uh, in the screening programs, these are routinely done looking for fecal local blood, but the stools for AOC, just don't forget to mention it because we exclude. Uh, ME, ME biases. Chest x ray, again, it's routine, but uh, that will pick up pulmonary metastasis. Then uh, the ultrasound is a must as an initial round, first round screening program, screening uh, tool. It will pick up hepatic metastasis and malignant disease. So how would you say that I will organize or I will request an ultrasound of the abdomen to pick up uh, hepatic metastasis and malignant ascites. And the transrectal ultrasound in diagnosing rectal bleeding, transrectal ultrasound is uh, uh, not uh, always you know routinely done. But uh, when it comes to inorectal cancers, once you have diagnosed, the external extramural spread can be assessed with transrectal ultrasound, uh, ultrasound, ultrasound uh, alone uh, with a uh, certain degree of reliability. And uh, if somebody asks that what is the uh, investigation of choice, radiological investigation of choice in lower GI symptoms or rectal bleeding, your answer should be contrast enhanced CT abdomen or it's also given the name CT colonography and uh, double contrast area minima. And uh, as I have been telling in upper GI series, contrast enema, double contrast barium enema is a luminal investigation. It will give some idea about the lesions in the lumen. But then when it comes to the extraluminal spread of cancers, uh, it's not going to give much information. So when it comes to investigation of choice, it is contrast enhanced CT abdomen or CT colon. And the most important, uh, ultimately the second exam will boil down to quickly rush through these uh, basic investigations and it will boil down to lower GI endoscopy. So actually the examiner is waiting for you to say I will arrange lower GI endoscopy. So it could be what are types of lower GI endoscopy if we ask. Always start with the, uh, the investigation available in the ward that is proctoscopy especially if there is fresh bleeding or uh, fresh blood, uh, proctoscopy can be done without much preparation uh, and it will diagnose hemorrhoids and anal fissures. But remember when you say anal fissures, you should say that it is contraindicated in acute stage because it is very painful. Even doing a DRE is uh, contraindicated because of the pain. Uh, then uh, lower GI flexible endoscopy. Are they are so yeah, uh, out of that the sigmoidoscopy is a short one and colonoscopy will reach up to the seek. And uh, we must say that colonoscopy is not only diagnostic but also therapeutic. So you can do polypectomies, biopsies, uh, and you see various changes in the mucosa to diagnose IBD and you diagnose cancers. Um, so the discussion will go on like that for investigations um, and this is something you have to master the next slide when it comes to long case specialty. Uh, 
this is a very commonly asked question and uh, it's sometimes sad to see that how some students struggle uh, after seeing so many lower GI endoscopies to give these few steps. So be well prepared to just rattle it off. So the examiner will ask, okay, as a house officer, how, uh, how would you do it? How would you prepare the patient for lower GI endoscopy? So go through these steps I mentioned there over and over again. And sometimes during your training program, various units might have slight modifications of these. But the standard, the standard uh, points mentioned here are generally accepted so that uh, if you if you remember these things in this order probably nobody will you know find fault with you so basically low fiber diet for about three days and uh, fiber supplements or antiviral medication has to be stopped some of these things might drop from your list unless you are prepared um, and then you have to, the day prior, you have to go on clear liquid diet and uh, sorry for the failings and uh, drink over oh, one liter of fluid per hour because uh, this preparation can lead to, you will soon see that the complications can lead to dehydration. So hydrating the patient, oral hydrating, hydration is important and uh, then the laxative has to be given, generally it's a peg, it's peg, uh, polyethylene glycol. Uh, it comes in sachets and then you should have seen the sachet, I'm sure most of you have already done, how it comes and how it is being prepared. Uh, and then it has to be repeated every four hours or six hours up to about four sachets. These figures two sachets or three sachets or four sachets, you have to be ready. You have to say directly, you know, that's exactly what you are going to do because uh, we all take that this preparation for endoscopy is part of the house officer's job. Uh, though sometimes in endoscopy units, of course, the nurses get involved. So uh, until the effluent is clear, And the procedure is generally done in the endoscopy room. Uh, and in the endoscopy room, what you will do is that always you need to uh, insert an IV cannula. And uh, most of the surgeons, most of the GI surgeons will give midazolam and uh, bascopan, that is hyacinamide. Uh, and uh, basic monitoring facilities has to be there because you can get certain complications like bradycardias uh, and uh, circulatory collapse. So uh, remember in all lower GI cases, long cases especially, this part is going to take a fair bit of your discussion time because uh, though you might know everything about coronic cancer and ulcerative colitis, diverticular disease, Suddenly, fine in the, when it comes to long case, your discussion time will come to an end at this point. So, master this without hesitation, go through these points and then present them uh, with confidence. Sir? Yes? Uh, sir, uh, in prior to colonoscopy, mm -hmm. uh, it's mentioned sir, there are uh, low fiber food for three days. Yeah. So, what are the few examples of foods uh, that are included in a typical local diet? Sir? Yeah, I think the uh, low fiber diet food means you avoid actually high fiber diet. High fiber diet includes all these uh, green leaves, various palas and various uh, green leaves. Uh, so, basically our, our daily meal contains those things. So, when you say low fiber food, uh, I mean... In our part of the world, uh, it is just avoiding these uh, high amounts of uh, green leaves and things like that. But rest is anyways uh, of low fiber anyway. So uh, unless the uh, 
units where you have uh, worked, they have given a specific uh, instructions. Uh, what you say, we tell the patient is that to avoid uh, green leaves, leaves and things like that for those three days because uh, then that will lead to a lot of uh, roughage there. Uh, do you have any, any other uh, suggestions? No. You all can uh, participate in this discussion. If you are to been taught anything else, you can share it with us. Okay. Uh, so, just ask questions and whenever um, you can interrupt me at any time. Um, then they explain the procedure. Actually, this part is asked to make sure that you all have visited the endoscopy room during your training program. Um, so these four or five points I think you have to mention. Uh, you must say that the informed consent has to be taken, that is after giving pros and cons of the procedure. And uh, generally, patient is uh, kept in left lateral position. So. Sometimes we ask, are you sure, you know, is it left lateral or right lateral? So uh, be sure about it and people who have seen and gone to the endoscopy room will be very confident, but uh, person who has not seen much uh, will be little jittery at this point. So just know it before you go, left lateral position. And the uh, scope has to be lubricated and it has to be advanced. Uh, negotiating difficult bends, usual difficult areas of flexures, uh, splenic flexure and the hepatic flexure and the rectosigmoid junction. So uh, those areas, there's a high chance of perforation. And then uh, mesentic stretch, especially when you are moving into the transverse colon, mesentic stretch can cause pain because generally bowel is uh, insensitive to any kind of internal injuries, but the mesentric stretch, mesentry has a lot of nerves, so, and then mesentric stretch can cause a bit of ischemic pain. Uh, so you have to warn the patient when you are advancing, otherwise he will start struggling. And then it's important, uh, once you have completed the procedure, arrange somebody to uh, drive him home. He can't drive back alone. Because giving these points uh, in a discussion will show that you are a safe, safe house officer. So uh, this looks very straightforward and um, silly to even mention, but if we take them as important points. Because at MBBS, we will not be asking for you know exact techniques of you know uh, advancing the endoscope and how we do uh, overcome the difficult areas. But what we will expect you to say is these things and always uh, advise the patient if he develops any undue abdominal pain to immediately get admitted uh, as you would have realized that uh, the perforation if it is missed it may lead to uh, disaster. Then again another question which is asked uh, in sometimes in SEQs and also if time permits, uh, if the history goes fast and then you know examination finding there is nothing much, uh, these are the questions which can come, is post-operative colonoscopic complications. Hypolemia and hypotension, cardiac failure during bowel preparation in especially in elderly. So you have to be very careful, uh, especially when you are asking the patients to drink liters of PEG, PEG, polyethylene glycol, uh, each, so it can lead to absorption and uh, overloading of the system. So you have to always find whether this person who is coming for the colonoscopy has home support, he is maybe living in all alone in a, in a home or some place. So I think uh, it is always will feel nice, you know, you will feel better if you say that uh, I will look for the background of this patient uh, before I ask him to take these uh, 
this laxative because it can cause hypovolemia, hypertension, cardiac failure, especially if it's an old patient. And uh, perforation and peritonitis always will present as an undue abdominal pain because you will have a little bit of discomfort in the abdomen after. But it is undue. You have to advise the patient, otherwise, he will just take some painkillers, or especially if it is done in an evening session. He might go home and decide to come next day with a full-blown peritonitis. And especially if you have done a biopsy or removed a, remove, remove a poly, like snare polypectomy, uh, again advise the patient that uh, it has rectal bleeding, especially, uh, to immediately get admitted because these are done as day cases. So uh, when you ask these things, these few points you have to keep in mind. Um, I have explained this most of these things in the in the table. Uh, any questions uh, you can ask in between. Uh, Post polypectomy electrocoagulation syndrome. Uh, if there has been some bleeding, say angio dysplasia, or if you have found some mucosal bleeding. A, a excessive for electrocoagulation can lead to uh, ischemic areas in the pore. And post-operative sepsis uh, is again a problem. And then uh, cardiac failure due to uh, fluid overload, I have already mentioned that. And colonic uh, bleeding, as I mentioned. Generally, what happens is these people are admitted with this complication most of it is except it's full blown you know you are suspecting a perforation and especially if the operation note says that uh, there's a difficult area difficult struggling to uh, there's a struggle to negotiate the scope then there's a high degree of suspicion then you can do either lapros diagnostic laparoscopic or open laparotomy or laparoscopy uh, but otherwise uh, if the abdominal signs are uh, not very serious, you can manage most of these uh, conservatively. But generally, these points, if the examiner asks, you know, about the, you know, this may be a long long question, even. So, a patient after colonoscopy goes home and come back with uh, severe abnormal pain, and parameters will show that you know, low blood pressure, tachycardia, and uh, that will be the short history. So, what will be your diagnosis and how will you manage? So, this slide uh, summarizes the answer. Then I think uh, now when these uh, general questions are covered, general coverage is given to this symptom, uh, we will be moving into some specifics most of the time uh, the discussion or the answer will be concentrated on uh, colorectal cancers so this being a very important topic you should have some uh, uh, good knowledge on these things and uh, what happens is generally at the last part of the discussion the examiner will ask or the question will be put to you uh, how do you manage suppose this is this how do you manage it so most commonly it will be that you will be given the endoscopic findings low gi findings that there is a rectal cancer and there is a polypoidal mass or a ulcerating mass in the lower sigmoid and how would you proceed so Investigations we have already discussed. So, first thing you must say, if it's any cancer you are thinking of, you have to say, I will be staging it. Staging the cancer to see whether the cancer is confined to the, the bowel, or whether it is locally advanced, or it has got metastasized. So, the whole staging is, the whole idea of staging is to answer these three questions. 
And very commonly asked question is that uh, what are the types of uh, staging you know in colorectal cancer. So I have a basic idea about uh, Dukes. So now we call it modified Dukes. Because Dukes had only uh, ABC. Modified Dukes have subgroups. And uh, I'm not going to go into details because these have been covered in your lectures. But this is a good summary slide. Uh, just to recapitulate your knowledge on uh, Duke staging. You don't have to know all the you know, fine details, but generally know that you say that I will stage it according to Duke's classification, modified Duke's, uh, which is associated with the prognosis. So you only if time permits, the examiner might ask, you know, can you just tell me what is Duke's? Uh, so as you know, nowadays Duke's has is some groups like B1, B2. So uh, just go through this slide leisurely and uh, try to get some idea. But uh, once it comes to Duke C, as you know, as, you, uh, as it is seen in this slide, lymph nodes are getting involved and Duke's D, uh, it is metastasis to uh, lung, liver, bone and skin. Um, then of course, uh, the treatment, you have to know the outline because only in MCQs we will be able to test your knowledge on some details about you know, the treatment modalities. But uh, just an outline, what sort of treatment modalities are available for colorectal cancers is very basic. And uh, whenever you are stuck, if you are asked how would you treat this cancer anywhere, they go by the modalities. As you already know, there are modalities are surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, hormonal therapy and molecular targeted therapy. So categorize, just categorize the treatment into these modalities. Some of the cancers, some of the modalities may not be there in those cancers. But when it comes to colorectal cancers, surgery plays, the, plays a very major role. And uh, just a rough idea about uh, what sort of surgeries you can do, uh, you should be uh, knowledgeable about it. When it comes to the upper rectum, uh, it will be restorative resections always because you can resect the cancer with its lymph node drainage area and then bring the ends together. So this is done as elective procedure and after bowel preparation and uh, assessing the patient for major surgery. This is called ARR or anterior restorative resection or in simpler terms anterior resection. Um, it is very basic knowledge but to our surprise we occasionally find that these words don't come to you all, some of you all. So if I give the case scenario they are okay this tumor was found in the uh, upper rectum or lower sigmoid, uh, always uh, quickly it should come to your mind that this can be resected. If it is resectable, resected and reanastomous. So it is ARR or anterior restorative resection. Then we come to lower rectum only, there are a uh, number of options there. Uh, lower rectum, if you can't get a good clearance from the anal margin. If you can't save the sphincters, then of course you have to get rid of the anal canal and the anal sphincters. So uh, that will be abdominal perineal resection. When it is done by two surgeons, as you know, it will called scaper or synchronized combined abdominal perineal resection because one surgeon will come from the abdomen, either open or laparoscopically, mobilize the rectum. Other surgeon will dissect the perineum and then when they meet inside the body, you remove the specimen and then the patient will end up in uh, colostomy, end colostomy. And uh, when at least 2 cm lower clearance cannot be achieved, uh, it will end up in a colostomy. So this 2 cm is it was a 
it was argued over the years, which is 5 centimeters or 2 centimeters. Uh, but generally now it is agreed that 2 centimeter lower clearance. You can get from the sphincter 2 centimeter clearance to the tumor. Uh, then of course, you can, uh, if you can't get it, you have to remove the anal canal. So know this principle because this comes in uh, some MCQs. And uh, other option is uh, you do a very low anterior resection. You come very close to the anal sphincters, remove the tumor and bring the colon up to the uh, anal sphincters and anastomosis using stapler guns. That is called low anterior resection and coloanal anastomosis. Some of you all would have seen these things. I am sure you would have, uh, when you are doing your general surgery and uh, GI, you would have come across these things. So, either its anterior resection is bringing colon to colon and this is colon to the anal canal. In the lower rectum, these are the options. That means, if you have to remove it, then you, have, you end up in a lifelong permanent colostomy. Now, all, the whole effort is to avoid that. How would you avoid it? That you can remove uh, up to a very low level and then get the 2 cm clearance, but only the inner sphincter will be remaining there. You can bring the colon and anastomose to the inner sphincter. That can be done from the abdomen or you can do it from below, uh, colon and anastomosis from below. Uh, using various special retractors called Parks retractors. So, Park is, Alan Park is a very famous colorectal surgeon. So, uh, that is called low anterior resection and uh, very specialized suites. I don't know how many of you all have seen these. Uh, without, uh, now when you do these, what, what happens is the colon is directly attached to the sphincter and there can be, there is no storage because as you know the storage part is the sigmoid, the colon. So, storage is gone. There are various complications that the patient can have uh, re, uh, fecal incontinence. So, to avoid that, nowadays specialist GI surgeons adopt a method of making a pouch. So, just know that it is happening. Uh, as called ideal uh, anastomosis with a rectal pouch. There are various types of rectal pouches are there. Uh, so, what happens is with the colon, distal colon, you make a pouch and attach the pouch to the anal sphincter. So, that feces will be collected in this pouch and then periodically expelled. And uh, another concept you have to remember is total mesorectal excision uh, because uh, Mesorectum. In lower rectum, there is no mesentery, but uh, earlier attention was not given to this primitive mesentery which is there and then lot of recurrences occurred in that part. So, uh, uh, this total mesorectal dissection by Bill Heal uh, is uh, nowadays routinely done. Uh, remember this knowledge is not generally tested at long cases or long cases, but uh, when it comes in your writing and answer, these are bonus points. And uh, when it comes to cecal cancer, it is right hemicolectomy because you can't remove only the cecal. The whole right hemicolon comes out. And uh, transverse colon or splenic fracture extended right hemicolectomy. Uh, so depending on the site of the uh, cancer, various types of uh, colectomies are there. And uh, <coughs> then when you are discussing the locally advanced uh, cancer, uh, you have to mention about uh, adjuvant therapy after surgical excision because Dukes B and C uh, can have either micrometastasis or macrometastasis in some of the uh, lymph nodes. So, that radiation therapy 
often with chemotherapy is frequently used as a neoadjuvant or adjuvant setting in fetal cancers. So, these are actually MCQ stems, MCQ responses actually and uh, chemotherapy alone is more common for the adjuvant and neoadjuvant treatment of colonic cancers. So, rectal cancers when it comes to rectal cancers it is radiation and chemo that is called chemo radiation. But when it comes to colonic cancers radiation is uh, uh, not that in, that uh, commonly used it is chemotherapy alone. So, when it comes to an MCQ stem, MCQ response, remember this difference. And uh, radiation methods, I do not have to go into details. Uh, you have to have a basic idea about this because you do a uh, cancer institute appointment. So, uh, external beam, brachytherapy, uh, endocavitary radiation therapy and interstitial brachytherapy. Out of these, uh, all these things can be tried in uh, advanced cancers either to downgrade in and make it operable that is called neoadjuvant the word neoadjuvant comes in that uh, or else as a uh, adjunctive or post operative. Uh, to finish this uh, today's discussion um, you have to have some basic knowledge about the hepatic metastasis of colorectal cancers it is another topic. Uh, very widely discussed at postgraduate level, but you should have a basic idea. Uh, as you know, the hepatic metastasis had a very bleak or very, a very gloomy outcome in the past, but there are now various ways of treating this hepatic metastasis to improve the prognosis. So, I have uh, summarized these uh, methods. Just uh, when you are answering or when you are, when you are discussing uh, a CQ, just do not forget to mention the sub uh, management of hepatic metastasis. Uh, surgical resection can be done that is uh, partial hepatectomy, especially if it is in the left side. So, local uh, uh, hepatic resections are uh, now in in the scene so that uh, do not forget to mention it when you when it comes to metastasic disease. And then image guided hepatic metastasic ablation is the new radiological technique, new minimal invasive techniques which are coming up very fast because surgical resection is a major uh, undertaking. Uh, that includes radio frequency, microwave, these are all actually energy sources and chemical ways of ablating the uh, secondary. Uh, if those are oligometastasis, that is, that means uh, if the numbers are few, if it is the whole liver is riddled with hepatic metastasis, of course, you cannot apply any of these things, but either single metastasis or few solitary metastasis, few solid metastasis, you can use this technique, surgical resection and uh, image guided uh, methods like radio frequency microwave, alcohol ablation, cryo surgery is just just freezing the metastasis can be done under CT guidance and uh, trans arterial embolization is hepatic artery is uh, calculated and uh, you can use chemotherapeutic agents to uh, ablate the hepatic metastasis and uh, finally uh, radio embolization you can use radio isotopes and this you might find it little uh, advance uh, when I give this whole list, but basically remember hepatic metastasis can be treated with a good prognostic uh, value. Um, palliative care includes chemotherapy and immunotherapy. I think you can literally go through this slide and uh, actually speaking you do not have to know the details, but just know that chemotherapy and immunotherapy is coming up in a big way. Earlier it was not there in colorectal cancers, but now it is coming in a big way for metastatic colorectal cancers. And uh, I think we will uh, we will continue the second half next day uh, with uh, massive rectal bleeding and the benign causes of uh, this rectal bleeding and uh, lower GI symptoms. 
and uh, uh, today I have not included very many MCQs, uh, but I think uh, if time permits, uh, what I will do is I will post you uh, these MCQs, uh, set of MCQs, uh, very short MCQs, which are kind of you know best answer MCQs, uh, and then you all can answer that and be ready for the second half. Uh, I will post it to you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for being with us. Yeah, any questions you would like to ask? I think we can spend five minutes on questions. Sir? Yeah? Uh, uh, sir, is there any relevance of uh, albumin levels uh, when uh, we need go for uh, AR or APR? Um, any relevance yes. with albumin levels? Sir? So, sorry, I, uh, repeat it again. Uh, sir, is there any relevance of albumin levels when you are deciding for an AR or an APR? Uh, albumin levels are generally yes, because uh, those are important for wound uh, healing. Because in hypoalbuminic patients, the wound healing is poor and uh, in the ARR there is a higher chance of uh, leakage. That is the biggest problem of ARR. Because uh, if bowels are not prepared and if there are general, general uh, features of poor wound healing, like poor low albumin levels, malnutrition, uh, all these can, things can lead to uh, anastomotic leak. Anastomotic leak is not a problem in APR because in APR or scaper, you remove the whole thing and there is only a uh, colostomy there. So that is how the albumin level comes into the scene. Okay, thanks. Sir. Yeah, okay. Uh, there is another question. Uh, TNM classification for go, uh, rectal col. Yes, TNM classification is there, and uh, you will find it in textbooks that uh, this tumor stage and the Duke stage. Tumor and Duke stage is compared, but actually the TNM classification, uh, if you know it is okay, but that is basically for more research purposes and people to compare their results. Uh, TNM classification, but the clinical classification is what is clinically and prognostically important classification will be Dukes. But uh, if you try to remember all TNM classica classification, it's going to be a little uh, confusing. But just uh, go through one of these uh, comparison slides and you will realize that Dukes A is uh, generally T1. T1 and Dukes B is uh, T2 uh, and Dukes, when it comes to Dukes C, it is T3 and N, N1. So, find a simpler way of remembering it rather than going in trying to memorize all the details of a TNM classification. Yeah? Uh, in ARR, what kind of ileostomy do we use and how long? In ARR, if the bowel is well prepared and patient was not uh, obstructed earlier, uh, ARR need not to have uh, an ileostomy because uh, most people will do the anastomosis without a guarding, what we call guarding ileostomy or uh, uh, protective, protecting ileostomy, uh, they will do the anastomosis if the bowel is well prepared. But the bowel is not well prepared, the surgeon might decide to have uh, an ileostomy is only uh, one kind of ileostomy actually. Uh, it will be a loop ileostomy uh, and uh, that will be temporary until the uh, anastomosis is healed and the uh, barium study shows that there is no leakage, then you can close the ileostomy. It all depends on the bowel preparation. And remember the bowel preparation. Power preparation will not prevent leakage. That's a very common MCQ. Bowel preparation will not prevent an, a leakage from anastomosis. If your technique is bad, if there are any other features like radiation uh, or malnutrition problems, which is going to cause leakage, it will happen. Just because you do a protecting uh, ileostomy, the leakage will not be avoided. But the thing is that the consequences of leakage, like peritonitis and septicemia and death, 
will be lower if you have a guarding or protecting hydrostatic. Uh, 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 left lateral position is important in colonoscopy. Uh, actually, it is uh, it is said that you know the GI surgeons when you are doing it, the manipulation of the scope is uh, sort of manipulating the left side. Uh, it is easier for them to uh, manipulate the scope through the difficult areas like uh, splenic fracture and the uh, transverse cord. So that's why many people adapt uh, the left lateral position. Uh, so uh, that's the answer to that. And uh, would the snare biopsy itself cause spread of malignancy if polyp has malignant cells? Uh, it has been very clearly shown that it is, it is not the case. Because a snare biopsy is generally done for a macroscopically benign polyp with a good stalk or a pedicle. Otherwise, you can't do a snare. If it is a flat lesion or a nodular lesion, you can't do a snare biopsy. What you do is punch biopsies from the normal mucosa and the lesion. So that uh, snare polypectomy or snare, snare polypectomy biopsy uh, it is not uh, theoretically or practically shown that to cause any spread of malignancies. And uh, can we start feeding after surgery? Yeah. Uh, yes, feeding of course. Nowadays, uh, if your anastomosis is sound and there is no other reason why it should leak, or especially if you have put a protecting uh, or a guarding uh, ileostomy to protect the anastomosis, feeding has to be done very early. Because as, as I have asked earlier, you should read about this ERAS protocol, uh, enhanced recovery after, after surgery protocol. It is becoming a, a norm now for all major colorectal and uh, other cancer surgeries. So according to that, very early feeding is very important for anastomotic, uh, for, for uh, wound healing and uh, patient recovery. So uh, even after the second day, you know, once the once the uh, effect of uh, if there's no ileus or anything, uh, very early stage stages you start feeding. Because some people, of course, will not wait for the bowel sounds to be heard even nowadays. Because what they say is, in any case, through an anastomosis, about six or seven liters of intestinal fluid is flowing. So if your anastomosis is going to give up and it start leaking, it will happen. So by feeding, it will not uh, actually uh, change anything. And feeding is beneficial nowadays, early feeding. And uh, at one stage, I remember, people were asked to chew, chewing gum, you know, after colonic, colonic surgery, which has uh, been shown to increase the uh, bowel movements and uh, healing. Um, uh, would this never be right? Uh, then there's a question in cancer. If we were to do a TNM classification, do we take into account the rectum? Does not have a zero cell layer, but uh, the straightaway invade perirectal fat, unlike the colon, and the T3 is invading zero cell. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the, you have a point there uh, because there is no uh, zero cell layer there in. Uh, but straight away invading parietal fat, unlike yeah, you're right. Like these are these are uh, accepted point. Uh, when there is no zeros are there in. Remember, it is in the middle and lower part of the rectum. The upper part of the rectum is uh, covered with zeros, and uh, T3 is uh, taking as invasion of uh, invasion of parietal fat. That's why in these lower rectal resections now. Uh, this uh, mesorectal resection has become very important because even if it looks like it is confined to the rectal wall because of the lack of serosa, uh, it is much more advanced compared to colonic cancer. Any more questions? Sir. Yeah. Sir, the so the surgery we done for the uh, locally advanced rectal CA, is it done under curative intent or palliative intent? 
uh, when it's done for locally advanced cancer. Ad advanced colorectal cancer what's your question is it a curative or palliative surgery all right uh, the thing is that uh, palliative surgery uh, depends on you know where, when you call palliative surgery uh, it is for advanced cancer but when the, when the resection is including all the all the lymph nodes uh, generally you do it with the intention of curing the patient but suppose it is locally advanced say t3 or it, uh, but still causing a uh, lot of obstructive features a surgeon might decide to go and do a palliative resection followed by chemo irradiation so it depends on the initial staging 